So, um, last year at the uh, London show, um, we uh, launched a big uh, improvement to uh, RISC OSM, the vector mapping software, uh, because we were able at last to support uh, contour lines on maps. Um, since uh, last, uh, last, um, last London show, um, we've uh, been able to extend this to other parts of Europe. Uh, initially, the release was just for um, contours uh, for the Bristol Isles. Uh, but now, on this, on this machine here, I see I've got lots of contour data available. So if we go to uh, somewhere where they have a few mountains, uh, we might be able to um, demonstrate that to you. Um, I've tested this one, so fingers crossed. Of course, um, this is a city rather than um, the countryside in Switzerland, um, but we should get um, we should get some evidence of contours in a moment, I think, once the rest of the map is drawn. Uh, yes, so there are some contour lines, as you can see, around these hills around the edge. Um, but yes, why don't we why don't we go for another place like? from a space shuttle mission uh, in about 2002 and NASA uh, did a uh, did this mission where they uh, measured the height of as much of the land surface as the earth as they could um, and this has been released as public domain data so we've taken that and converted that so that it can be used with risk OSM but there are a few uh, anomalies in the data and actually we seem to have hit on one of them because here you see the middle of the map, um, the contour lines are all disappearing around uh, the centre of uh, the, the Matterhorn the summit um, because there must have been some anomalies in, in the uh, space shuttle data around there. So you're getting good, uh, fairly good contour line data around here. As you can see, if I zoom in, um, you'll, just, you'll see it all spread across the map. Um, but actually, the summit of the Matterhorn, that's one bit that NASA didn't get right. Um, and we haven't been able to fill in the gaps. Um, <laughs> so, um, I thought while, while, while we're uh, just showing you the contours, um, it's perhaps useful to um, demonstrate a few little features you might not have been aware of. Um, so, this contour uh, button here uh, turns uh, the contours, contour display on and off. Um, but also, if you click the menu over it, uh, there are options for how uh, frequently you, you want the contours to be displayed. So if we're in a very mountainous area, suppose you only want them every 50 <coughs> metres and labelled every, um, every 100 metres, uh, we can do that and it will then um, yeah, simplify the view of the map quite a bit. Uh, and you can do that as any scale of map, uh, just just the contours independently of the rest of the information on the map. Um, so, yeah, contour uh, data was uh, a big thing uh, last year, and since then, um, Hillary has been working uh, mainly on a new uh, feature, the style editor. Uh, so I'm just going to go to um, another part of the world, to demonstrate this, uh, we'll go back to the British Isles. Oops. Cross. Cross. Sight of. <coughs> 
rather sad um, episode in uh, English-Scottish relations in the uh, 14th century. Um, so, uh, typical sort of map variety of different types of environment here, urban and uh, rural um, uh, features. Uh, so, uh, a good um, area to demonstrate this on. So, uh, for a while there has been a features uh, window, which you can open up with Control F or by uh, choosing from the menu. And um, the features window acts as a sort of key to the map, um, telling you what everything is. Um, and has a number of nice features in itself. Uh, you can, for example, um, if you look down the key and you think, oh, that's interesting, um, where are these uh, soccer pitches which apparently are on the map? Uh, you can uh, click over it like this and um, say, highlight soccer on map, and uh, they will then be highlighted in yellow. Uh, you'll see them around various parts. Um, of the map. Um, so this feature I think came in a year and a half ago or so, something like that. Um, it, but it also has uh, tick boxes allowing you to turn um, things on and off. Um, so if we wanted to omit um, all of the leisure facilities we could actually tick there and then maybe um, perhaps we will retain the uh, cricket and the hockey, um, and we can update the map, um, which will then re-display. Um, it doesn't have to reload the data, but uh, it will still have to re-render. And you'll see around here where the university's sports fields are, uh, most of them have now disappeared. But we do have some cricket pitches over here still being shown. So obviously that's quite a, quite nice, especially if you're wanting to do a custom map which uh, shows some features uh, and omits others that you're, you're not interested in. Um, where we've taken this a step further now is that you can much more easily um, decide which ones should be displayed, but also how they're displayed, um, including all the colours and dash patterns for lines, uh, and hatching and all sorts of stuff like that. So I'm going to zoom in a bit so that we can get something to play with. Um, and um, right, we'll, what we'll do is we'll go and find the feature for Woodland, which is up here. So I'm going to open the style editor now, which is the new feature of this, uh, uh, this show by double-clicking on Woodland. Um, and it might look a little bit baffling to start with. Um, it is a complicated thing. It's an awful lot simpler than editing the star sheets that are behind the maps by hand. But there's only so much complexity that can be completely hidden from the user because um, it's a complicated business. So what we're seeing here is various attributes that are applied uh, in order to render woodland on the map. And you'll see here that it tells you about the tags which are behind the scenes in the OpenStreetMap data. So it's looking at the tag land use uh, with the value forest. So land use equals forest, or land use equals wood, or natural equals wood, or natural equals woodland. Now there's quite a lot of variety there, and you may think that's a bit um, confusing, and it is. OpenStreetMap is a, essentially a, a system in which anyone can contribute, and as a result, there is a bit of inconsistencies in terms of how things have been tagged around the world, and things will uh, gradually develop. So uh, people might have started off by using um, land use equals uh, forest, and uh, some people maybe put land use equals wood, and after a while, a debate happens in the OpenStreetMap community, and uh, one tag will win out over the others, and people will update uh, the, the data. But the style sheets uh, that we provide and try and aim to uh, smooth over these rough edges by doing the right thing, uh, what would people would expect with the variety of data that's out there. These, the whole thing is shown 
with uh, a, a, a grid. So there are columns here, numbers from 8 to 20. These are the uh, zoom levels, the different scales of map that uh, RISC OSM renders. And you'll see underneath more conventional um, ratios. So if we're looking at maps um, between 1 in 40,000 and 1 in 80,000, as is this column here. And um, what you'll see is this, the woodland uh, at those scales is just shown as a green area. So this line here, which says display alongside it, um, that shows you um, what the feature will look like on the map. It's a little preview, really. Um, so at uh, 1 in 40,000, or scales smaller than that, um, you'll just get a green area for the woodland. But if you go into a larger scale, then we start getting a little tree symbol, which might be a little deciduous tree or a little conifer. Um, and also the name of the um, uh, the name of the forest or woodland might appear as well. Then underneath we have a row of uh, tick boxes. These show you which scales. These are a quick way of turning off the feature at different scales. So you can run along there and, and turn it turn it off and um, to define which uh, scales you want the thing appearing at. And then underneath we have the main part of the window where the colour of the area is defined, um, the uh, colour of the text is shown, and uh, other features such as the images which are displayed. So this actually uses two different images, one is a colour for and one is a deciduous tree, and it will tile them randomly, uh, no closer than 10 point uh, in each direction, 10 points of distance uh, on the, on the uh, render. So we can change any of these things. Oh, yes, and then we've got the color of the text and the size of the text. So just to do a quick demonstration here, uh, I could change the, um, the text size to a large one, and maybe we'll pick a different color, something uh, Maybe a little bit more revolting, so you can see the difference. Um, and I'm also going to try adding um, text type setting. Oh, uh, sorry, font style setting. Uh, we'll make the um, make it bold, um, and I'll apply that at. Uh, the zoom levels 14 to 16. Sorry, 14 to 20. It's going to be right, isn't it? So, we'll then, uh, if I then set this and uh, we'll update the map, uh, you should then see that these areas of woodland here, which are named are now in the uh, purple bold text which was larger than it used to be. Um, we can also apply um, other <coughs> effects, so for example we might want to add some hatching, so I'm going to add um, hatching which is just sort of darker than the um, existing um, existing area and uh, we need to define what type of hatching we've got. Um, it's going to be, I don't know, five points apart. And you can um, have hatching at a variety of different angles. So we'll just take, <coughs> choose this at 25 degrees. Is there anything else I need to set? That's uh, done the direction. Or you can even have a dash pattern. So you can have uh, hatching which is dashed lines. So uh, why, why don't we do that? So uh, I'll set that again and update the map. With a bit of luck, 
Ah, yes, there we are. You'll see we've now got um, some diagonal dashed hatching coming across the um, woodland. I'm not sure the colour is quite what I expected. Maybe I made a mistake there. So there's quite a lot of variety in what you can do. Um, now, although this is a major new feature, which has um, a lot of had a lot of work go into it, um, there are some further ideas that we have uh, for improving it. It's just uh, very much uh, the initial um, release of the style editor. Um, for one thing, it's not very easy at the moment to. Um, alter the style of, of, well in fact to make anything appear which uh, is not being shown at all on the map at present. Um, and also if you're wanting to maybe differentiate between things which the style doesn't distinguish between at the moment, uh, then you can't easily add a, a new style for, I don't know, say a different type of shop. We've got, we've got styles for a variety of different shops, but if there was one that was missing the style editor at the moment doesn't allow you to add another, another one easily. It's mainly for modifying what's already shown on the map. So there are some improvements planned to address those uh, defects as well. And um, I've got ideas for having um, some sort of wonderful editor for the colours so that maybe you can change the colour of um, a variety of different features all at once. So if we've got symbols for sports, for example, which mainly involve possibly dark green, then you could maybe change all of them at once to, um, to use a different colour so that you can produce a nice consistent design but one which is completely different from what is provided with the software. So anyhow, um, when you've done um, your major changes uh, with the style editor, you can then save uh, the um, style under your own um, under whatever name you uh, choose and use it again in the future and you can have a variety of different styles it will it's possible to uh, make a style which is based on one of the default styles and where in fact just the differences between the default style and uh, your variant are saved and that's an advantage because if we update the main style sheet with more features those would then automatically be inherited by your style sheet um, and uh, but, but you can also um, define a style sheet which is completely standalone and has a copy of absolutely everything it needs in order to generate the map. Um, just trying to think what else I can demonstrate with this. I mean, the, um, there are also um, features like. With the yeah, with, with for example uh, roads, um, as well as the main uh, features of a road, such as its uh, colour and how wide it is, at different scales. Um, there are um, things like um, bridges, so there can be an extra section at the bottom of the style editor, which reveals um, additional uh, modifying factors. So. If there is a tag that says bridge, or a tag that says tunnel, then, the, then some extra borders or, are applied, or with the tunnel, it turns into a dashed line to make it uh, clear that it's uh, not actually on the surface. And then there are some extra uh, lines that are added to um, roads if they are one-way streets, or um, if they are private access, and things like this. So it's um, quite a complicated business altogether, which is why um, it's taken um, a year or so to develop this. Um, it's something that uh, we had in mind ever since the software was released. And uh, um, obviously, uh, one of the great things about um, Risk OSM is because it is rendering the map from um, raw data um, every time you uh, draw the map, uh, there is great scope for the map to be drawn however you want it, rather than however the map designer has uh, decided to um, design it. So um, it takes the advantage of having a vector format for the map 
a step further by giving the users um, the ability to change, change it however they wish. Um, which is something you can't easily do with um, online options like um, you know Google Maps or Bing or wherever you go for online maps because they tend to be uh, done mainly using tiles which are predefined. Now, um, I'm just trying to think what else we need to tell you about. Um, Oh, uh, perhaps all to say, uh, the, the price for the upgrade for this, uh, if you've kept up reasonably up to date and have the version of the software that uh, deals with uh, contours, uh, then uh, the upgrade cost is just £5 uh, for the download version. And I've got um, also some uh, map data packs uh, with me today if you want to um, get your map data updated don't want the hassle of downloading it, or if you want a stick or an SD card to take away with the software and the map data on it. The um, other uh, features that I was going to show you um, are uh, relate to online uh, services. Um, and I think actually a couple of years running at the London Show I have tried to demonstrate uh, things which have um, needed uh, my computer to be online and failed each time, usually because the laptop had kind of disconnected itself from the internet uh, or, or something like that. Um, so I was very pleased to find uh, this time that the, um, the internet connection is working for this machine. But unfortunately, the new um, piece of software I was going to show you um, isn't. I haven't yet worked out why. Um, the problem is, of course, that uh, the machine that I bring to the shows is not one that we use generally at home. Uh, most of the development is done on an Armex 6 or an Ionix, um, and they're a bit too heavy to carry on the train all the way down from Durham. So I usually use, bring a, I, I bring a broad panda board with me uh, and a beagle board because they're nice and small. Um, but they're not the machines we normally use day to day, so the software hasn't been tested yet thoroughly on that. So, um, you may have noticed on the uh, RISCOS forums that uh, there's been some work going on uh, on a bounty for improvements to um, the network uh, modules for RISCOS. And one of the uh, modules which has come out of that, uh, which is on beta release at the moment is the ACOM SSL module, which does uh, secure socket communications across the internet. So it allows you to do HTTPS connections uh, from software. Now obviously a lot of uh, software like Hermes and NetSurf and so on does secure connections already, but that's built into the um, software uh, via libraries that those particular applications use. Um, the new work uh, that has been funded by the Bounty is to bring that into a module uh, form. There was an ACON SSL module quite some time ago when ACON was still developing the browse uh, web browser, uh, but um, the, uh, the encryption standards have moved on such uh, since then that uh, that old module is totally useless now. So the, the Bounty has been uh, funded and um, Work is going on and is nearly complete for the ACOM SSL module. And this makes it much easier for ordinary application developers uh, like ourselves, who don't understand the details of all the um, this, what's going on with the encryption underneath, uh, to, to make um, software which can uh, talk to um, other services across the web. Now, um, one thing that we added um, a few years ago uh, was a feature to get uh, to allow you to fetch uh, pictures from the web, and there was a service called Geograph, well, it's a project really, which started out as a project to gather um, a typical photograph of every single um, kilometre grid square on the national grid. Uh, that was their ambition to start with, and it seemed like an immense kind of project. I mean, thousands and thousands of photographs required. Uh, but of course, such is the power of the internet that uh, it's quite 
it, it, it outgrew that original intention. In fact, they've got lots and lots of pictures uh, from, especially from urban areas, um, from each uh, from grid squares across uh, the United Kingdom. Um, now uh, they have what's called an API, uh, an application programmer interface, which means that um, applications like Risk OSM can go and fetch, uh, go and do a search and say, "I'd like photographs." close to this uh, location, what do you have? And um, what ought to happen if I click fetch uh, is it should go and get some pictures. And uh, it did actually get some of them, but has then gone slightly wrong. So you'll see here, uh, there, is, uh, there is one picture uh, from down by the riverbanks uh, in Durham. And it has uh, managed to get the details of quite a few more. And if I click on, um, uh, control click on this, you'll see that it can open the geograph site and we can uh, see some more of the um, scenery around, uh, around Durham. Um, I'm not quite sure why it isn't fetching uh, all of the pictures. That was working and uh, it has been working in Risco Sound for a few years. I've been unable to demonstrate it at the show because of this internet connection issue in the past. The internet connection is working today, but the software has gone wrong in the meantime. So that's something we'll be fixing soon. Um, anyhow, the Geograph service just used plain HTTP, insecure communication. Um, however, there are a lot more services out there which have HTTPS, um, re which require HTTPS. So if you've been alert, you may have noticed that on this window there is also a radio button for Flickr. Uh, now Flickr is a massive service where people put up, put their photographs and some of them may make public or they may just share them with friends and there are, there are millions and millions of photographs from all over the world. Geograph was just a project for the British Isles. Flickr, you can go anywhere in the world and find pictures. Um, so we have a new little application which is poised for release quite soon, which will help Risk OSM by uh, fetching pictures from Flickr. And we have one or two other services as well in mind, which I don't want to mention just in case it turns out to be more complicated than I hope. Um, so um, the, the Flickr application uh, was working uh, yesterday at home on the Ionix and on the Armex 6. It is not working on the Panda board for as yet unexplained reasons, and I'm not able to show you it now as a result, sadly. But it is rather nice. Um, one of the problems with Flickr actually, there are so many photographs and you have to put in a search term to narrow it down. So quite often if you just put in the name of the place you're uh, actually in, that helps and you can get back a lot of photographs or building or whatever you're interested in, in, in really densely photographed areas of the uh, world, like central London for example, you could probably put in almost any search term and it will come up with pictures of something. Uh, so um, it's, quite, uh, it's quite incredible how many pictures have been put up there. And when it's working properly, it puts up these photographs in the pane to the right hand side and uh, pops them on the, on the map. And they appear in a temporary folder as well in the pins and tracks window uh, where you can see more details about each photograph, including the descriptions of uh, which the, uh, the photographers have added when they uploaded them. And if you want to, you can then uh, copy those uh, pins into a permanent folder to uh, retain. Um, so you can go back and look at these pictures again. And many of them are distributed under quite liberal licenses where you can actually reuse the photographs in your own publications, for example. Often you need to um, attribute the photographer. Um, there are also commercial uh, photographs available through Flickr, which is an option we could uh, look at making, um, extending the search to those. But for the moment I've kept it just to the, to the non-commercial photographs. <coughs> So, um, I think we're nearly out of time, and uh, I'd probably better uh, leave it at that, unless people have some quick questions. Thank you. Okay.